Live from Boston, it's theCUBE. Covering IBM Chief Data Officer Summit. Brought to you by IBM. Welcome to theCUBE's live coverage of IBM Chief Data Officer Summit here in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Paul Gillum. We're starting our, our coverage today. This is the very first day of the summit. We have two guests, Caitlin Halfordy, she is the AI Accelerator Lead mm -hmm. at IBM, and Sonia Metzetta, the Data Governance Technical Product Leader. Thank you both so much for coming Thank on theCUBE. Thanks for having us. So this is the ninth summit, which is, is. which really seems hard to believe, but, but we're talking about the growth of the event and just yes. the, the kinds of people who come here. Just set, set the scene for our viewers a little bit, Kayla. Sure, so when we started this event back in 2014, we really were focused on building the role of the Chief Data Officer. And at that time, we know that there were just a handful across the industries, few in finance and banking, few in healthcare, few in retail, that was about it. Um, and now, you know, Gartner and Forrester, some industry uh, analysts say there are thousands across industry. So it's not so much about demonstrating the, the value or the importance, now it's about how are our Chief Data Officers going to have the most impact, the most business impact. And we're finding that they're really the decision makers responsible for investment decisions, bringing cognition, AI to their organizations. And the role has grown and evolved. Um, when we started the first event, we had about 20, 30 attendees. Um, and now we get 140 that join us um, in the spring in San Francisco and 140 here today in Boston. So we've really um, been excited to see the growth of the community over the last uh, four years now. <laughs> affect the, uh, the relationship, IBM's relationship with the customer. Traditionally, your uh, constituent has been the CIO, perhaps Absolutely. the COO, but uh, you've got this new C-level executive. Now, what role do they play in the buying decision? There was really a lot of, you know, I think back to, um, I co-authored a paper with some colleagues in 2014 on the rise of chief data officer. And at that time, we interviewed 22 individuals, and it was qualitative, because there just weren't many to <laughs> interview. I, I couldn't do a quantitative study. You know, I didn't have sample size. Um, and so it's been really exciting to see that grow, and then it's not just um, it's not just the numbers grow; it's the impact they're having. So, to your question of what role are they playing, what role are they playing? We are seeing that more and more their scope is increasing. They're armed and equipped with teams that lead data science, machine learning, deep learning capabilities. So they're differentiated from a technology perspective, and then they're really armed with the with the investment and budget decisions. You know, how should we invest in technology? Um, use data as a strategic corporate asset to drive you know drive. Our, our progress forward and transformation. Um, and so we've really seen a significant scope increase in terms of uh, roles and responsibilities. And I will say though, there's still that blocking and tackling around data strategy. What makes a compelling data strategy? Is it the latest, greatest? Is it going to have an impact? Um, so we're still you know, working through those, those key items as well. So speaking of what makes this compelling uh, strategy, I want to bring you into the conversation, Sonia, because I know you're on the Automated Metadata Generation Initiative, which is a big, which is a big push for IBM. Can you talk a little bit about what what you're doing at IBM? Sure. So I am in charge of data governance products internally within the company, and specifically, we are talking today about the automated metadata generation tool. Um, what we've tried to do with that particular product is to try to basically leverage automation and artificial intelligence to address metadata issues or challenges that we're facing as part of any traditional process that takes place today in trying to do curation for metadata. So um, specifically, what I would like to also point out is the fact that the metadata curation process in the traditional sense is something that's extremely time consuming, very manual, and actually tedious, right? So um, one of the things that we wanted to do is to address those challenges with this solution and to really focus in and hone in on leveraging the power of AI. And so, you know, one of the things that we did there was to basically take our traditional process, understand what were the major challenges, and then focus in on how AI can address those challenges. And today at uh, 4 p.m., I'll be giving a demo on that, so hopefully everybody can understand, you know, the power of, of leveraging that. This may sound like a simple question, but I would imagine for a lot of people outside of the CIO, uh, the IT organization, their eyes glaze over when they hear terms like data governance, but it's really important, so can you describe why it's important? Absolutely. And why metadata is important too. Absolutely, well, I mean, metadata in itself um, is extremely critical for any data monetization strategy, right? 
the other importance is in order to derive um, critical business insights, right, that can lead to monetary value within the company. And, you know, the other aspect to that is data quality, which Interpol talked about, right? So, you know, in order for you to have the right data governance, you need to have right metadata in order for you to have high level of data quality. Can, you know, if you don't and you're sitting, you know, spending a lot of time cleaning dirty data and, you know, dealing with inefficiencies or perhaps making wrong business decisions based on bad data quality is all connected back to having the right level of data governance. So, I mean, I want to also go back to something you were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, and that's just the, the sheer number of CDOs that we have. Right. We have a statistic here, 90% um, of large global companies will have a CDO by 2019. That's really astonishing. Can you talk a little bit about what you see as sort of the top uh, yeah. threats and opportunities that CDOs are, are grappling with right now? And let me make this tangible. I'll just describe my last two weeks, for example. <laughs> I was with the CDO in person um, in Denver of a beer company organization, and they were looking at some M&A opportunities and figuring out what their strategy was. Um, I was at a bank in Chicago with a, with a head of enterprise data government there, looking at it from a regulatory perspective. Um, and then I was with a large uh, multinational retail organization with their CDO and team, figuring out how did they work at a sort of global scale, and what do they centralize at enterprise data level, and what do they let markets and, and teams Teams customize out in out in the field, out in the out in the geos, um, and so that's just an example of you know regardless of industry, regardless of of of, um, of these challenges, I'm seeing these individuals are increasingly responsible for those strategic decisions, and oftentimes you know we start with the with the data strategy and have a good you know discussion about what is that organization's monetization strategy, you know how, what's the corporate business case, how they're going to make money in the future, and how can we architect a data strategy that will accelerate their progress there um, and again you know regardless of product we're selling or retail or yeah, excuse me uh, industry it, those are the same types of you know uh, challenges and opportunities we're grappling with in the, in the early days there was a lot of um, uh, questions about the definition of the role and the CDOs sat in different different departments and reported to different people. Are you seeing some commonality emerge now about how this role, where it sits in the organization, what its responsibilities are? It's a great question. I get that all the time. And especially for uh, for organizations that recognize the need for enterprise data management, they want to invest in a senior level decision maker. And then it's a question of where should they sit organizationally. You know, for us internally within IBM, um, we report to our chief financial officer. Um, and so we find that to be quite a uh, compelling uh, uh, fit in terms of in terms of budget and uh, you know visibility into some of those spend decisions, um, and we're on par and peers with our CIO. So I see that quite a bit, where a chief data officer is now you know on par and uh, a peer to the CIO. Um, we we tend to find that when it's uh, potentially buried in the CIO's organization, you lose a little of that auton autonomy in mm. terms of decision making. So if you're able to position as partners and drive that transformation for your organization forward together, um, that can often work quite well. So that partnership, is it, uh, I mean, you ideally it is collaborative and Absolutely. collegial, but is it ever, are there ever tensions there and how do you, recommend companies get over overcome those obstacles. Absolutely, you know, in the fight for resources that we all have, especially talent, right, and retaining some of our top talent, should that individual or those teams sit within a CIO's organization or a CDO's organization, how do we figure that out? Um, I, I think there's always going to be the challenge of who owns what. We joke, sometimes it feels you own everything when you're in the data space, uh, because you own all the data that flows through, all your business processes, both CDO owned and corporate HR, supply chain finance. Sometimes it feels you don't own anything, you know, and so we joke that it's um, you have to really carve that that out. I think the important part is to really articulate what the data strategy is, what the CDO or Enterprise Data Management Office owns from a data perspective, and in building out that platform, you do it in partnership with your CIO team, um, and then you really start to be able to build and deploy, you know, those AI applications off that platform. That's what we've been able to see. So I want to go back to something Sonia said this morning during the keynote. You talked about IBM's master meta data uh, uh, list catalog that is unifying your, your uh, organization around a certain set of terms. There's 6,000 terms in that catalog. Now, how did you arrive at 6,000? And what are the what are some rules for an organization that's trying to do something like that for how, how defined, how small should that set of terms be? Sure, well, we started off with a traditional approach, which is probably something that most companies are familiar with these days. Um, the traditional process was really just based on 
basically reaching out to a large number of subject matter experts across the enterprise that represent in many different data domains, such as customer offering, financial, et cetera. And essentially having them you know, label this data specifically with the business metadata that's used internally across the company. Now, another example to that is that there are different organizations across the company. We are, we are a worldwide company, and so what one business might call a particular piece of data, which is customer, another might call a client, which really ended up you know, being this very large list of you know, 6,000 business terms, which is what we're using internally. Um, but one thing that we're trying to do to be able to kind to basically connect the different business terms is leverage knowledge management and um, specifically ontological relationships um, to be able to link the data together and make it more reasonable and provide better quality with that. One of the things that you were talking about and Interpol was talking about on the main stage too during the keynote was making sure that the data is telling a story because getting buy-in is one of the biggest challenges. Um, how, how do you recommend companies think about this and approach this very big, uh, daunting task? I'll start and then I'm sure you'll have a perspective as well. One of the things that, um, that that we've seen internally and I work with my clients on is every project we initiate, we really want strong sponsorship from the business in terms of funding, making sure that the right decision makers are involved. Um, we've identified some projects, for example, that we've been able to deploy around supply chain, so identifying risk in our supply chain processes. Um, some of the risk insights, we'll, we're going to demo a little bit later today, the AMG work that Sonia is leading, um, and all of those efforts are underway in partnership with the business. One of my favorite ones is around enabling our sellers to better understand information about and data about their customers. So like most organizations, customer data is housed in silos, systems that don't necessarily talk well you know, with each other. And so it's an effort to really pull that data together in partnership with our digital sellers and enable them to then pull up you know, a user interface, user friendly, an app where they can um, identify and drill down to the types of information they need about their customers and so our, our thought and recommendation based on you know, our experience and then what I'm seeing is really having that strong partnership with the business um, and, and the, the, the contribution funding, stakeholder uh, involvement, engagement, and then you start to prioritize where you'll have the, you know, the most impact. You lead a program called the AI Accelerator. What is that? We did, so when we stood up our first chief data office, it was three years ago now, we wanted to be quite transparent about the journey of driving uh, cognition through our enterprise. Um, and we were really targeting those CDO-owned processes around client, master, product data, and then all of our enterprise processes. So that first six months was about uh, writing the data strategy and implementing that. Next, we spent a year on all of our processes, really mapping out, we call it journey mapping, I think a lot of folks do that, um, by, by uh, 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 by process, so HR, supply chain, identifying ways, you know, how it's done today, how it will be done in a cognitive AI-like uh, like future state, and then also as we did as we're driving out those efficiencies and automation, those reinvestment opportunities to to, to free up that money for future um, initiatives. And so that was you know the first year, year and a half, and now we're at the point where we've evolved far enough along that we think we've learned some lessons on the way, and you know there's been some hurdles and stumbling blo uh, blocks and obstacles. Um, and so a year ago we released our, our cognitive enterprise blueprint, and that was really intended to reflect all of our experiences driving that transformation, a lot of our customer engagements, a lot of industry analysts' uh, feedback as well. Um, and now we've formalized that initiative. So now I have a, a really fantastic team of folks working working with me, subject matter, domain expertise, um, really deep in different processes, uh, solutions folks, architects. And what we uh, what we can do is pull together the right, you know, breadth and depth of IBM resources, deploy it and custom, you know, customize it to customer need and really hopefully accelerate and apply a lot of what we've learned, a lot of what our clients have learned um, to, to accelerate their own AI transformation journey. But AI, but IBM is the guinea pig and, and yes. the showcase, and so yes. you're learning as you go and helping customers do that too. Exactly, and we've now you know built our platform, deployed that. As we mentioned, we've got about 30,000 users um, using our active users using our platform. Uh, plan to grow to 100,000. Um, we're seeing about 600 million in business benefit internally from the work we've done, and so we want to you know really share that and and do some some good you know best practice sharing and accelerate some of that progress. I, IBM chooses the 
the, to use the term cognitive uh, rather than AI, what, what is the difference or is there one? I think we're starting actually to shift from cognitive to AI because of that exact <laughs> perspective. You know, AI I think is better understood in the industry and the market and that's what's resonating more so with clients and I think it's more reflective of what we're doing. Um, and our particular approach is human in the loop. So we've always said rather than the black box sort of AI you know, algorithms running behind the scenes, we want to make sure that we do that with trust and transparency. So there's a real you know, transparency aspect to what we're doing. And the other thing I would note is we talk about sort of your data is your data, insights derived from that data is your insights. And so we've worked um, quite closely with our legal teams to really articulate how your data is used. If you, you know, engage and partner with us to drive AI um, in your enterprise, making sure we have that trust and transparency, you know, swim lanes clearly articulated um, is another you know, important aspect for us. Getting right back to data governance. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly, which is our, <laughs> we've come full circle. <laughs> well, Kaylin and Sonia, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. It was great and great to, to kick off this, this summit together. Great to see you thank again, you as always. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Knight for Paul Gillum. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of IBM CDO Summit here in Boston. Thank <laughs> you.